Please, let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. As pastor, it has been my responsibility to officiate many funerals. Some have been expected deaths and others have been unexpected. Deceased people of all ages, rich and poor, from all walks of life, Oaxaca, I consider that the tragedies suffered by the children, by children and young people, are usually the hardest. Sadly, the idea that tragedies occur due to the sins committed by those who suffer the tragedies is widespread. That thought was present in the times of Jesus. With these ideas to the grief that people already experience, the lack of empathy is added with the idea that they suffer the consequences of their faults. The truth is that many Christian churches think like this. Many of the fundamentalist groups. This thinking has done a lot of harm to people. In our reading this Sunday, the Gospel of Luke says that some who were present on that day told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. The text is not a descriptive as it could be, but what we may assume is that false Galileans were murdered by the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. While on a pilgrimage to make a sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. Indeed, the same prophet who preceded at the trial of Jesus and gave the final order to his crucifixion. Then, moments later, Jesus refers to the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. There is no doubt that there were two big tragedies. One caused by the tyranny of the Roman ruler Pilate, Last week, Jesus made a harsh criticism against Herod, the Jewish king, and the second tragedy would seem to be an unfortunate accident. Perhaps the tower was not constructed properly. We want to know, why do bad things happen? And so we ask, what did Pilate murder those people? Why did that tower fall? Sometimes the answers we have found may be true, sometimes no. Sometimes it's a mix. Sometimes in this life we will never know. Since he was conscious, the human being has tried to understand the world, to understand the cycle of life, which includes death. He has tried to understand natural phenomena. He has tried to understand why some people do better in life and others are doing poorly. The reason why there are accidents. Because sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. In a battle, the human being has constructed different explanations. Returning to the biblical text, an answer that the multitude seems to cling to explaining the murder of false Galileans and the tragic death of the 18 was that of retribution for sin, that bad things happen to bad people, that suffering is the serve, that when people suffer, 
is because God is punishing them. In this way of explaining the world, the Galileans who Pontius Pilate killed are the people who perished because the tower fell on them was because they were terrible people. They were sinful people. Probably not publicly, but surely those people were secretly sinners. Therefore, the survivors are better people, those preferred by God. The matter of human suffering is a topic that has interested me for years. My first thesis to finish my seminar was about it. It is in the Spanish language. I must tell you that the wonderful book of Job in the Bible does not support the idea that human beings suffer tragedies simply because they are sinners. Job himself was suffering, not due to any internal or external sin. The world is more complicated than that. If you are interested in the subject, I recommend you read the entire book of Job. And above all, the teachings of Jesus Christ reveal the answer to such an ancient question. Jesus gives us consolation to the soul's trouble by those who have suffered a family tragedy. You are probably wondering why my son or an infant suffer an early, an, sorry, an early death? Or why he or she suffer a serious accident? Or why I suffer from an act of violence in my youth? In my first year as a pastor in the mission of La Jolla, where I was a student pastor, uh, was going to receive a visit from a member of the district superintendent's cabinet. A woman would be our meeting leader. The woman came from a town two hours away using public transportation. The mission was very enthusiastic because it was the first time it had been considered for a meeting. There was, they were, sorry, ever children, even children, present and people from other denominations only for curiosity. The meeting would begin on a Saturday at 4 p.m. But our sister in Christ took so long we waited for her for more than one hour. At that time, the use of cell phones was not common. Finally, she arrived very late. But her appearance was of great sorrow. And she began to cry and turn. She said that a group of men tried to abuse her on the bus. I will not say more details. She was crying for a long time, but a sister from a different denomination asked her not to cry. Indeed, this had happened to her because she was a sinful woman. As a leading Christian woman, she should not cry in public because it was something unworthy. Because Christians, in her opinion, and that of her church, should always show a strange and a smile on their lips. I was a young pastor. That was my first appointment. But I already believed in the pastoral investiture and continue to believe it today. Just as the woman of a different denomination was publicly scolding our guests, I had to publicly admonish her, saying that what she said was false, that our Methodist Church did not believe it. On the contrary, it was good that our sister continued crying so that she could faint. Imagine in addition to suffering the terror of violence, in addition to being told that indeed she was the culprit. 
the sister from a fundamentalistic church, in addition to not expressing empathy for her, added more guilt and shame to her who was in shock. I am a pastor who considers that one must be very careful with the shared teachings and doctrines. It's not a matter of competition between churches. It's a matter that some teachings are incompatible with the Word of God and others seek more manipulation of people. The results are evident when, for example, many Christians think that we have to fight against the recommendations of doctors and scientists. Many groups emphasize entertainment, having a good time, but not in having a commitment, a loyalty to the local church. Although it sounds very nice, that is contrary to the word of God. That is why any preacher or a speaker from another church must be approved by the pastor of the local church. And this is not optional. I love the collaboration between churches. I am ecumenical pastor. When there is healthy doctrines involved, respect and ministerial ethics, typically what is practiced is the change of groups. Preachers from other churches come, still in turn, I go and preach in the pulpits of all same churches. It is a principle of equality and mutual respect. In our gospel today, Jesus is tremendously consoling. Jesus replied, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? Regarding the people who were killed to the tower fell on them, Jesus responded, Do you think that they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? In both cases, Jesus' answer is clear. They were not more sinful than you. So, do not brag. Do not think that you are better than those. Let us stop assuming that those who have perished in an accident or illness or because they are poor are because they must have some public or secret sin. Jesus has thrown to the ground that theory is valid that suffering in this life is only explained by the fact that we are paying for our sins. Sometimes it may be true, but many times it is not. The main issue here is, it is not for us to make judgments, only God, only to God. It is not for us to make judgments, only to God. This is liberating. Those common practices have brought much pain, have justified many pointing the finger of blame, and have given the evangelical faith such a bad name. Sadly, being that it was something positive. When the crowd comes to Jesus pointing fingers, Jesus does not join in both calls the crowd to account for their own infractions. But unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. The reality is that many things that happen are out of our understanding. Many things that happens are out of our control. Jesus Christ calls us to focus not on what lies outside our control. He calls us not to accept judgmental explanations. Jesus Christ instead invites us to focus on what we are in control of. We are called to grow in holiness to be better people with others, 
to give ourselves more and more to the Lord. The Gospel of Luke mentions repentance more often than any other book in the Bible. Repenting is an act of turning entirely around 180 degrees to leave our sin behind us. Repentance is more than telling God we are sorry. One person said, apology without change is manipulation. Repentance requires changing. I am going to give you some advice. Don't let the phrase, we as humans, I'll make mistakes, give you much comfort. The saying is true, but don't conform to it. Your eyes should be on Christ, not on anything less. Then Jesus told them a parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vine yard. And he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit and this fig tree, and still I find none. Could it that? Why should it be wasting the soil? We are all a fig tree. And we are all called to give delicious figs. I love figs. My wonderful neighbors in North Carolina have a wild fig tree that produces delicious figs. God wants us to bear fruit and give us time to do so. According to the parable, the owner waited three years. That is, the same years of the earthly ministry of Jesus. And after that time, the time, is, the wait is over. The man came looking for fruit on it and found none. The owner ordered the gardener that the term had expired. Could it down? What should it be wasting the soil? The gardener that symbolized Jesus replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Most of us live in a false sense of security and assume many things. We assume we will live to see the sunset. We assume we will wake up the following day. And we assume we will arrive at our destiny safely. Tragically, that is not always true because tragedies can strike at any moment. The truth is that all of us are living the period of grace that God has given us and that only He knows how long it will last. God has been very patient with all of us. Jesus intercedes in favor of the big tree, the fig tree of us. Lord, give it one more year and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not, you can cut it up. We have been spared the axe. Having survived this pandemic of COVID-19, having overcome illnesses, accidents, surgeries, financial problems, and more. In this new spring season and late season, you have given another chance. Thanks be to God. But should you use God's blessings as an opportunity to return to old ways? Or will you be so bold as to 
says this day that you have to do something different? You have been given the gift of today. Today the gardener, the Lord, is ready to work through you, nourish you by his spirit, forgiving you your sins by his almighty grace that you may bear fruit. In this time of Lent, you are called to give thanks to the one who has spared you from the acts and given you the gift of today. Don't squander this gift by returning to the ways of sin. Jesus says that unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. So turn away from the ways of sin and death and towards the one who will bring new life. Today the fig tree was spared the axe, but it was not by the success of the fig tree, but by the grace of God. Only God knows when he will look for the fruit from us. Also remember when someone suffers, empathize with that person. Also remember it's not for us to make judgments, only to God. Please let us pray. Oh Lord, we have been spared. You have spared us and in your mercy. You give us the gift of today. Let us not set this gift aside or take it for granted, but instead cast us to return to the ways of righteousness and love. It is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.